All right, well, welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us. We're really <laughs> excited to be here and to have this conversation. Um, this session grew out of an interest to take advantage of the amazing gathering that is Sphinx 20 and to talk frankly, frankly and hopefully helpfully to an emerging and arriving generation of black and Latino musicians about race, ethnicity, and life in American orchestras. Um, so with that in mind, and to help set a factual frame around things, let's uh, quickly look at some statistics. So uh, as of 2014, American orchestras are about 86% white and 14% non-white. And you can actually see the breakdown there of our non-white um, musicians. It's about 9.1% uh, Asian and Pacific Islander. It's about 2.5% Hispanic and Latino musicians and 1.8% African American musicians. Um, our boards, so our boards, the boards of American orchestras are uh, holding steady there at about 92% white and 7.8% uh, uh, non-white. Uh, staffs, similar to musicians. All of this is coming from a recent report put out by the League of American Orchestras, Racial, Ethnic, and Gender Diversity in the Orchestra Field. That's available for download on the League of American Orchestras website. And we can see there that our staff sort of mirror our orchestras. So 80%, 86% white and 14% non-white. Um, so leading up to today, the panelists and I had several really great conversations. And I can tell you that it was really a privilege to uh, get to listen to these folks talk. They're all brilliant. Um, as, oops, we missed a slide. Well, there's a graphic map that we have of our conversations, and that will be available for you to view on uh, the website for Sphinx, Sphinx Connect 20. Um, so let's just dive in here. So, you know, uh, I think we should start with a really uh, basic question, um, which is, you know, why does the lack of diversity matter? And just before I get to that, actually, since I don't have that graphic map up there, I'll just sort of unpack quickly how our conversations went. We really talked about um, these three things. So the orchestra is a predominantly white institution. We talked about navigating, and we talked about thriving. And we're going to try to organize our comments today around those things. Um, and we don't have a lot of time, and we want to leave time for your uh, questions for the panel. Um, so we're going to try to move through things uh, quickly. But let's start with um, actually meeting our panel, right? So why don't you guys take a second and int introduce yourselves to everyone. Hi, my name is Titus Underwood. I'm originally from Pensacola, Florida, so I'm from the South. Uh, I went to Cleveland Institute of Music for my undergrad and Juilliard, Juilliard School for my master's. Um, I just finished playing two years as acting associate principal in Utah Symphony. Now I'm going to be playing principal of Nationals, Nashville Symphony starting in September. Um, and played a bunch of places in between, a lot of stuff going on. So nice to meet you guys. My name is Garrett McQueen. I'm the second bassoon of the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra, and I'm the senior programmer, producer, and host of a show called The Afternoon Concert on the Knoxville NPR affiliate radio station, 91.9 FM, WUOT. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is John Madison. Uh, I have a master's in viola performance from the University of Michigan, and I'm the principal violist of the Michigan Opera Theater Orchestra, and I play regularly with Detroit Symphony. Uh, I teach at Wayne State University and play in a couple chamber groups, and basically I'm the ultimate freelancer. <laughs> among, like, the ultimate here. freelancer. My name is Maureen Conlon Gutierrez, and I'm originally from central Mexico and I have uh, degrees from Rice University, Penn State, and Carnegie Mellon. Um, I kind of am the ultimate freelancer as well. I uh, play in the Pittsburgh Opera Orchestra, and I sub pretty regularly with the Pittsburgh Symphony. I'm concertmaster in the Erie Chamber Orchestra in Erie, PA. Um, I teach, I'm on the faculty at Grove City College, and I play in Trio Nova Mundi, so a little bit of everything. All right. Um, well, let's dive in here. So this first question, you know, uh, John, uh, why don't you take this up first? So, so why does the lack of diversity matter? Well, I think it matters because we live in a diverse society to begin with. And, it, you know, it, it should, the orchestras and everything should represent that we have more than just non-white people in society. 
Also, I think it, it matters, uh, you know, from an audience standpoint because um, you know, minorities go to see concerts. Um, I've had people, you know, be playing with Detroit Symphony, and I would have, you know, black individuals come up and say, you know, I'm really happy to see you on stage because, you know, it's nice. It's just nice to see that, and um, it actually, you know, have had people say it makes them actually feel more welcome to know that there are people like them that are doing it which you know takes me to the young people um, also I think it's really important you know for people who are studying music to see people that look like them doing what they're doing so they, that they can identify with it a perfect example was the juniors concert yesterday Sphinx competition um, and when uh, the young lady that came out that won uh, she, she walked out on stage, you know, wearing her dashiki dress and her Angela Davis afro, and she was so beautiful. And um, yeah, <laughs> and the, there were this, these elementary kids that were sitting in the front section, and they walked out, and they just were like, they were like stunned. And then she started to play, and the boys were like on the edge of their seat, and the girls were just elated. And you know. Uh, you, Several of us in the orchestra talked about that. What a difference it made for them to see her play so beautifully and to see her win. And uh, they're like, you know, they're, they're going to say, I can do this. But if you don't really see someone like you doing it, you, then you don't, you're not that encouraged to mm -hmm. think that you, it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Titus, you know, from your perspective, do you have anything to add to that? Why do, you, why do you think the lack of diversity matters? Why are we talking about this? Um, I want to come from great, great angle. I want to come from a different angle. I want to say it matters because orchestras represent capital, represents money, represents wealth, high society, right? Um, and I want to talk about certain specific wealth gap, right? So over 30, there was a study done by the Corporations for Enterprise Development Institution Policy of 30 years of examining the Federal Reserve saying that it would take approximately 228 years for blacks to amass the type of wealth that's in the white community. That's a huge wealth disparity. And that also speaks to blacks being real about it. We're descendants of slaves and how that affects us as far as money and access is concerned. I mean, my last name, Titus Underwood. To be frank, that's who owns it. So for us to really navigate and be real about it, we have to talk about how that affects us economically and the issues that are around that, and actually have measurable solutions that's talking about money, things that are concrete. And another problem that we deal with in this society is, is that we don't really know historical context of how, the thing, how these things happen. So I always say, white people should read about black history to know about themselves. Just like black people should read about black history to know about themselves. So how did this become a white institution? How is this a thing? And why is there such wealth disparity? Because there was access to capital, if you really think about it, most black people are one provider away from poverty. That's one. Because my dad was the first person who was able to work, get a real job, and provide a life for his kids. And I have other cousins who are very poor, who are in prison, things like that. It's a very real issue that we have to deal with that's specifically going on in this country that we don't deal with. And it's like the elephant in the room when we talk about, oh, we need to see people out there, but it's just proximity within white institutions progress. Is that just that? Or are we going to talk about how to actually create a system where it's going to be fair and actually put people in places and compensating for those things that has happened over the past? So. Mm -hmm. So uh, in our conversations, uh, there was a clear consensus among our panelists that um, bias can exist in orchestras, just like it can exist in any other space. And uh, we talked about this in regards to uh, auditions and tenure. Um, Ty, since you were just speaking, can you sort of speak to how you think bias can manifest in auditions and uh, how we might mitigate that if possible? Um, I, I am definitely an audition purist. I'm the person who says, the screen should be up the whole way. I think that people say, oh, let's look for 
blacks and Latinos, and then let's figure out how to get them into orchestra. I mean, we had that discussion a million times, and then we look at the statistics, 1%, 1.8%. Why is there <laughs> not a difference? And then we say, hey, we need to start with the kids because maybe there aren't enough qualified people right now. But the issues right now is what's going on. It's not saying that there aren't qualified people right now. I think that just by having the screen up and we're taking care of the training on our side, you by default would see more diverse orchestras because they go into a system that is fair. Because the hardest thing for humans to change is their conviction, how they view something. That's the whole process. That takes a very long time. No one just doesn't decide that I'm not biased, therefore I won't be biased. No, you're biased. <laughs> That's how it is. So in order for us to break that down, let's make the system fair and then we'll see a change in orchestras. All right. Um, so let's talk about, no, yeah, we can applaud that, that's cool. Um, <laughs> let's talk about tenure. Maureen, you know, uh, so do you think that bias can manifest in the tenure review process? And uh, well, we'll start with that. I mean, and, yeah, and if so, you know, what, what, what do we do? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Titus. Um, and so once you do win that job, um, having every orchestra has a different system and either it's a one year or a two year tenure process. And music, as we well know, it's very subjective. So they can vote based on your playing or the unconscious bias, which let's face it, is gonna be there because um, we're human. So how to deal with those situations? Well. One, don't give them a reason to not uh, vote for you. And um, we'll get to that later. And two, I mean, just for orchestras in general, for um, the orchestra committees, coming up with some kind of contract, just like corporate America does, where you do have to prove why you are voting one way or the other and show, okay, is this person getting the job done? Yes or no? And that's it not based on whether you like you know, the color of their skin or their culture or what they bring to lunch. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Does anyone else on the panel have anything? Yeah, Garrett. Uh, so the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra is um, unique in many ways in that in the audition process for the finals, for the third round, the screen actually comes down. And many people f are concerned with this because they don't want unfair bias one way or another. Um, and when we're talking about working toward diversifying orchestras, there seems to always be this fear that if we work specifically towards diversity, the quality of the orchestras may, you know, we may sacrifice that. Um, for, for me, with the KSO, you know, the screen definitely came down and, um, and I completed the audition successfully. Maybe the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra was really interested um, in diversity. I'm still the only uh, black musician in that orchestra. Maybe the best man won. I think it was a little bit of both and uh, we, need to, we need to not fear what diversity could uh, do to orchestras because if anything, it'll, it'll enhance orchestras. Mm -hmm. we've, we've mentioned unconscious bias and we heard actually on, from the stage today uh, from Walter Bittner about uh, activities that the National Symphony is taking undergoing some unconscious bias training. Is that something that you think that orchestras should um, begin to or incorporate into our into our culture? Anybody? Everybody? Um, I see. I think absolutely. Um, I think what happens with us having this training, we need even in the training, there needs to be people who represent the people who is being trained for. Like say, for instance, if there are a ton of male CEOs have some women in there talking about the issues because they have that perspective and we need to be humble enough to know that, you know what, I don't know your perspective because I haven't lived your life. That's okay, you're a human. And just like we're talking about black kids or black musicians or Latino musicians, have them in the room with the discussion. I mean, the reason why America became so lopsided because it was a bunch of, to be frank, white men writing laws and who's in power? So, because no one else was in the room. So for us to actually change these issues, we need to have the people who we want to see in these places be in there talking about these biases. And then we can really get into the dialogue and figure out what's the best solution. This is not a threat to anyone. Right. This is about humanity. This is about, this is a cancer to humanity. 
dealing with these issues if we keep hiding them, but we look at the statistics and the numbers stay the same. Numbers don't lie, everyone knows that. So I think it's absolutely uh, critical that we start mm -hmm. dealing with those things. So you see me uh, clicking through here. So we're actually gonna be talking about uh, navigating next, and I had a slide for that, but I can't seem to get it to come up. So <laughs> let's play with our technology a little bit and see if it's in here. There it is. <laughs> you know, since we're doing this, let's go back. Let's see if that other slide I was looking for was in here as well, and it wasn't. So all right, I, I went too far. I was asking for too much. All right, so here we are. So let's talk about this, right? This is a lot. We spent a lot of time talking about this, right? Um, so what about navigating, right? What is it that you'd say to a young black or Latino musician who just won a position in an orchestra? How should they, as a black or Latino musician, navigate this predominantly white space? And Maureen, why don't we start with you? Sure, so you're referring to how do you get the job done? Yeah, how do you, how are you, you know, how do, how do you? Keep how, the job. And keep the job. Not, yeah, yeah, and then maybe, uh, even, maybe even also after you've got the job and kept the job, you know, you still now are looking at a 20-year career. Right. Um, so I've seen both sides. Uh, having played with Pittsburgh Symphony, I've seen some of the, the fellowship, the African-American fellowships work really, really great, and some of them not work at all. And I think the key issues are always boiling down to, you know, our cultures are just so very different. Um, and, you know, we are late to things. Um, we are a little bit louder, we're a little more boisterous as people. And um, so there's a lot of making sure that you are, you figure out what your orchestra has in terms of what is on time. Some orchestras want you there 30 minutes before, some 10, 15. Find out what it is um, and be there. Make sure that you are that person that shows up, is prepared, has the music, has your instrument. Um, and there are lots of little things like don't show up wearing sweatpants, you know, look, look professional. Um, we tend to like our more uh, flamboyant clothing, which is great because we look fabulous in it, but maybe don't bring that to orchestra rehearsals or on concert stages. Uh, that tends to be a little bit of a problem. And then uh, just not practicing, not being prepared. I mean, it's, I can't emphasize that enough. You have to be the most prepared person on stage because like we said, they are trying to find a reason to not have you there. So if you show up and you are only somewhat prepared or not prepared, enough, then you just gave them a reason to say, oh, you can go. Um, and so I think those, those are basic things. Uh, each orchestra has tiny little quirks. Um, Pittsburgh Symphony likes their music on the stage 30 minutes before, so I didn't know that when I showed up, and no one tells you these things. So ask questions, find people in orchestra that you can um, discuss these things, these little unsaid rules so that you're not giving anyone an excuse to either not like you or not vote for you or not support you in that organization. Mm -hmm. Can I raise the ground a little bit? Yeah. Let's, let's hear from, yeah, let's hear from good, then John, I'll come back to you on this. Here, sure. Go ahead. When we're talking about navigating these predominantly white institutions as, as a black person, that's the experience I can speak on. I was inspired by a question that um, Dana Wilson asked at the opening plenary. She asked, in essence, what do I do about white people accusing me of ill-gotten success? All right. Um, as a black person, this is something that you're going to deal with. I've certainly dealt with it. And, and you, have to, you have to understand that that is going to be the culture and that's going to be the rhetoric in a lot of people's minds. So, so what do you do about that? Um, I, I view it in two different ways. Um, the first way is to behave, you know, get your tenure, tenure, don't ruffle any feathers, and make sure your colleagues are comfortable, your white colleagues. Now, this may be better for you professionally, but I have to consider the fact that this changes our psychology and the, and the perception of being a black person in a predominantly white institution like, and, like an orchestra. And, uh, and it's not easy for anyone to make it into an orchestra. The audition process is very difficult. 
but if you are a black person that has made it, that is quite significant when you look at our history and, and, and the things that have been made available to us over the decades, and you need to keep that in mind, okay? That's the first thing. The second way, which I tend to, um, you know, gravitate toward a little bit more, is to not sacrifice your beliefs in any way and, and don't sacrifice any part of yourself. Now, um, I've, in my experience, as the only black person in one of these institutions, you're going to be viewed as the representative. Now, the black community is not a monolith, but you have to understand that that is just gonna be in people's minds. So you have to be immediately responsive to language or actions that you feel are not um, good for the black community. Uh, words or actions that you know can be viewed as bigoted or, or straight out racist. And I say immediately responsive because if you don't say something, in your mind, you are the representative for that community. So they could potentially use you as justification in those actions toward other people, not, and not only in the orchestra, but in their everyday life, okay? Now, uh, now, I don't pretend that this may come at a cost. You may ruffle the wrong feathers. You know, it may even, you know, you may have to even sacrifice your tenure. But I, I believe that you have to really be in tune with the way that you think and the way you view yourself as a black person in these institutions. Now, other things to consider, like it's been said, you can't give anyone any excuse. I feel like black people, we have to be the best because there's always going to be that desire to find a way to justify the thinking that, that Dana Wilson's question came from, ill-gotten successes, okay? Now, I love, I love classical music, I love my non black and brown colleagues, most of them, anyway. <laughs> but, but, but I believe being in a predominantly white institution like classical music comes with more than just the physical part of being black, looking different. It comes with the responsibility of navigating these institutions very specifically and very actively and doing your part to change the psychology behind these PWIs and ultimately changing the predominantly white face of classical music. Mm -hmm. John, did you have something oh, yeah, else? No, I just wanted to, to add to actually what both of them were saying uh, about having to be the best. I mean, I tell all of my students, why do you want to be you know, just good? It's not good enough just to be good. You know, strive to be the absolute best. Be, you want to be better than everybody else. But being uh, like a black man that when I, I first came up in my uh, youth orchestra, I was the only black face in my youth orchestra. And I didn't, you know, I had to go to New York to see Marcus Thompson playing in the viola section where I'm, oh my God, there's another black person that plays the viola. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that. And, but my experience, and, and still sometimes people say, you know, how did you pick up a viola instead of a basketball? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, or, or just so shocked to see me walk into the room carrying the thing and, and the expectation is so low. So that for, for me, I have to like be so much better so that it, erases any preconceived notion of me from the m moment that I walk into the room. Mm -hmm. And so, like Maureen said, you know, show up on time, bring a pencil, be prepared for the first rehearsal, which a lot of orchestras aren't, but, if, but you have to be, especially if you're a guest or if you're a new member. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of having to be better than everyone else just to be put on the even playing field. Mm -hmm. and, but I have to say, though, since Sphinx, Fewer people are asking me, how did you get into this? Mm -hmm. Because of Sphinx's presence on PBS everywhere, people are seen. In Napa, mm -hmm. when we, you know, people would walk, the audience would walk in and they'd see this whole brown orchestra mm -hmm. and they literally were shocked. Like, they couldn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. it, it was, because it was, you know, Napa. <laughs> it made, you know. <laughs> The only brown people in Napa were either picking the grapes or on stage playing in their orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, well, clearly, um, all of you guys are thriving. And if you want to find out how they're thriving, check out their bios or Google them. These guys um, and gal are killing it, right? These folks are killing it. Um, and uh, in our conversation, some themes came up around this. Um, we talked about networks, we talked about portfolios, we talked about playing your behind off. Um, so to all of you, you know, what is it that you're doing? How have you organized your career 
uh, so that it is thriving. And, and Maureen, do you want to go first? Um, well, hmm. Or you, we can come back if you want to think for yeah, a second. Well, All right, I can, I can um, go ahead. Uh, I think, um, like we said, prepare to be the best. And I, I want to uh, throw something else out there, kind of a wrench in the gears, right? Because <laughs> okay. I don't like to self-praise myself or anything right. like that. But I want to say, um, I, I want to stress something we haven't talked about yet, is yes, white counterparts and, and allies, you are very important extremely important. Take that into your space with your other white colleagues and, and say, hey, I went into a black space and this is what I learned. And this is what I can bring to you. Let's really analyze how we think. Because it's not for the black person to come in and say, I represent black people, therefore, now you're educated. No, go read some black authors. Go, go, go subscribe to a black podcast. Live in that world. Not looking at, say, let me go to Wikipedia, now I know the statistics, I'm an expert. No, everybody thinks they're a Google and Wikipedia genius these days, but that isn't, go live with the people who understand that, and then we can really get, and, and, and as far as thriving is concerned, I always want to strive to be the best, and I keep hearing about being the best, being the best, being the best, but what if you still need some time to grow? Is there a place for black fragility? Is there space for you to grow? Do you have to be the Barack Obama everywhere you show up? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I do think that there are measurable spots of thriving, even when you're growing, you're thriving. And I remember when I first started doing well in auditions and all this stuff, I thought to myself, people really measure themselves about what symphony they're in, what school they went. I went to Juilliard, yeah, I'm just Curtis, blah, blah, blah. But what's, that's actually diminishing your growth as a person, limiting, limiting it to a title. You're creating art. I said I am in the tightest Philharmonic. That's the best Philharmonic on the planet. I'm the <laughs> principal. And that's how I felt about it. So I do think that learning, thriving is about how you view yourself. What contribution are you doing in the world creating music, no matter what color you are? Because I know it's hard for anybody in this business, I get that, and tenure for anyone. I understand that, so really know that that self-worth comes from the inside, not from mm. what title you have. Mm. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you say, and when we talk about thriving in, in these institutions, for me, I have traversed this by just being the most real and honest and authentic version of myself that I can be, you know, like you said, I'm not the um, Barack Obama of everywhere I go, I'm the Garrett McQueen of everywhere I go. And, um, and when, we, when we talk about diversity, I think we need to understand that it's deeper than just skin color. We all, you know, like I said earlier, the black community is not a monolith. So I have many opinions and I have many ways of going about things that people disagree with and they don't like. But I think I owe it to myself and I owe it to the art to be as much of myself as possible. And that would be the advice that I would give any person of color trying to traverse this world of classical music. But when we're also talking about thriving, I think um, we, it, it can't, we can't understate the importance of networking and a community. I don't have the benefit of having a black colleague in my, um, in my orchestra. So if you do, if you're one of those lucky people, it should be your first goal to maintain a relationship with that person so that you have a support system. And if, if you don't, like, like I don't, find a support system somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be a purely black support system, but it needs to be somewhere where you feel comfortable having these conversations to where your mind can grow and ultimately your music and your art can grow. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, John. Uh, yeah. I um, I say, uh, you know, I thrive. I think that we all should should remember why we're doing this um, because we love music. We 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 play music. We don't work music. Uh, and you know, I just remember the first time I got paid for a gig. I was in high school, played at a church, got a check for twenty dollars. I was shocked because I didn't know I was going to get paid. And I was like, I thought, wow, I'm getting paid for this. You know, it just didn't compute. I love this so much, and so always remember you know, how much we love it. And, and like he said, you know, having a network, uh, Sphinx is a great network, you know, Gateways is a great network, NAM, there's different, you know, people, you know, I would come and play with Sphinx, 
for you know the weekend, surrounded by my friends and everything, and then I would go back to my other jobs, and then I would still have them on stage with me because what it did for me was it, it tore down the wall of an, a certain insecurity that I had being the black kid, you know, sneaking in so that I wouldn't get, you know, bullied by either blacks or whites for playing classical music. Because now, you know, we do have a network. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain sense of security that goes along with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we can applaud, we can applaud. Corinne, what, what about you? Yeah, I, I think also one really important thing is, um, I think when we are, preparing for auditions, um, finding people that are gonna be supporting you, that are gonna ask a lot of questions from people that you trust, um, from fellow Latinos, from fellow black people that have already been down that road and that have experienced the positive, the negative, and find out how they did it. Um, I find myself now kind of in that position of helping the next generation, when they come and ask me, okay, what, how can I do this? How can I prepare for auditions? How can I get a job? How can I keep a job? And um, it's, it's a really important thing. I mean, one amazing thing that I love about Sphinx and coming here is being on stage with the Sphinx Symphony, everyone in their seats loves what they do. And there's this, unfortunate um, concept, not, not everyone, not 100% of orchestra members, but a lot of orchestra members become extremely complacent and almost end up hating their jobs. And mm -hmm. I think one thing that is very fresh and exciting about SSO is that everyone absolutely loves playing and loves their art, their craft, and they're giving 100%, we're all giving 100% all the time. And you can feel that, you can see that. I know the audience can, can grasp that energy. And I think if we bring that to our orchestras, if we're the one Latino or the one black person in the, in the orchestra, and we are bringing that passion and that love for our art, the people around us will also notice it, they'll see it, they'll appreciate it, and the audience will enjoy their concert going as well. So that is something that I always try to remember when I get on stage, be it a rehearsal or concert, I am bringing 100% of me to that program. Mm, fantastic. Um, we're, gonna leave, we're gonna leave some time for uh, questions. We have one more question for the panel, but um, I don't know if we have, we do have some microphones. So if people, if you have questions, if you wanna start getting ready, we'll, we'll get to those. Oh. <laughs> 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 And let me tell you in the dance, um, I saw Jamie Bennett do this the other day. I thought this was brilliant. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a few questions at a time and then turn it over to the panel to, to digest and answer a few questions at a time. Um, but before we get to that, I have one more question for us. We've talked about uh, the need for diversity as it relates to connecting to community and attracting new audiences. We've talked about it from the perspective of um, access to capital and historical inequities. Um, just for our last question here, uh, and it's a big one, but we'll try to go through it quickly. And I wanna know, is there a creative or artistic case to be made for diversity, equity, inclusion in orchestras? You know, um, will the art be better if our stages are more diverse? I, I, can, I can just say when I'm programming my radio show, my listeners have a genuine interest in hearing an orchestra from Finland if I program a piece by Sibelius or if I program some Shostakovich. They're interested in the uh, Russian orchestra's interpretation of that. All right, so, new, uh, so American music is starting to really um, become popular and I think American orchestras need to represent America in, in its diversity and it will absolutely feed the art form and make it better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else? I mean, I completely agree with what he's saying. I think also for the healing process, I mean, cultural exchange. Um, that means that's what America is about. That's what being human is about, is cultural exchange. So I think because if it's different, then you have more creative ideas how to reach your broader community. So, I say, how, so how do we reach the community where if the orchestra is more, the answer is already be there. 
they don't have to go through. We we'll, we'll start having less and less forums where we talk about this, mm -hmm. and it will just be in motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we could also uh, start affecting what gets programmed on concerts. Mm -hmm. um, why do we always have to be hearing the same white composers? And if we are in the orchestras, we can start to say, hey, how about a black composer? How about a black female composer like Jesse Montgomery? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there are so many great works that just do not get programmed. And the audience will naturally want to gravitate to listen to something fresh, something new. Excellent. All right, well, we have a bunch of people that want to get in on the conversation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take two questions from this side, and then I'll take two questions from this side, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to take some notes uh, to maybe refresh our panel and you guys can pay attention to. So, yes. Hello, uh, my name is Joshua Jones, a former Detroit Symphony Fellow. I just graduated in June. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the psychological warfare that you have to deal with. I know going through the program myself, uh, coming straight out of college, it was a little weird going to the job and, you know, just navigating through that and, you know, doing all the you know, psychological things. So with people saying certain things and, you know, snide comments and oh, things like that. Yeah. So just something about psychological warfare and some <laughs> strategies you use to keep your self-esteem up. Sure. All right, Thanks, excellent. Thank you, Alex. I'm Charles Dickerson from Los Angeles. Um, our country uh, over our history has, has made some tremendous strides from Jackie Robinson to Barack Obama to Garrett and Queen. Um, we have just entered, an, <laughs> we've just ne entered a new era, uh, one which I think, at least for myself, and I think for most people in this room probably, give us some cause for pause about the progress that we've made relative to the very issues that the panel represents. I'd like to get the panel's thoughts about how they might perceive the changing dynamic of the American society uh, on how it is that we approach this whole idea of making our orchestras more diverse in a time when it seems as though many in our society question whether diversity is a value. Excellent, excellent. From this side. Hi, my name is Morgan Beckford. I work with the Memphis Music Initiative. I am not an orchestral musician. I'm actually a vocalist, but I think a lot of what you're talking about translates into opera as well. Um, Garrett said that we are not a monolith, and I know that there's a lot of discussion right now about whether or not, which I believe it's not, the, the responsibility of the oppressor to educate, or the, the, the oppressed to, yeah, educate the oppressor, right? So what is the best way to encourage colleagues who may not be in this room, in this really healing, wonderful space, who tend to disengage but not trivialize the pain that they feel in these really, really difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Morgan. She asked my question, but I'm Shanti. Hey. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll take one for you, yes, sir. Uh, okay, I, I want to say I'm, I'm the free thinking here. I had a great career. I didn't have a lot of a career, but I made it to the Kennedy Center basically by and it some, uh, began to be a little bit too much uh, hidden figure. And I was juggling all these things, and I, I didn't, I never had an agent or a manager that um, could teach me about numbers. So I'm kind of trying to have a comeback, if there is a comeback to be made. But every time I talk to the janitor or the bus driver, blah, 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 I always get stuck at, we, it's on us to excite the kids and educate the kids. But what what are we getting out of it? What 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 excitement? I, I think you know. I hope I'm being respectful, but I could say, well, it's nice to have a Puerto Rican on a baseball team, you know. But that person is getting paid great money to do what they do. I mean, where where do we have the the pleasure and the honor of being paid? to be American professionals. Excellent. What, what is the question? Um, it actually, sir, can you, can you give me a favor? Do, can you just rephrase your question one more time for the panel here? Just the, the nut of the question. Um, I, I just want to, I'm just saying, I, I feel like the responsibility seems to be, 
Oh, the re responsibility seems to be all on us, the artists, to to do the work of this. I mean, what are we getting out of it? I see, I uh, see, uh, I see. I understand, I understand, thank you. Um, okay, so do you guys, do you want me to review the questions or do you feel like you have any? We heard from Joshua talking yeah. about uh, managing uh, what psychological warfare. Um, Charles was asking how this new era that we're uh, perhaps in, how that sort of influences our thinking. Um, Morgan talked about the responsibility of the oppressed to educate the oppressor and how we might shift that and encourage um, our colleagues, who I'm not framing as oppressive, but... Um, can I um, uh, maybe can address a couple of... Oh, and this, let me get to the sorry. last one. The last one seemed to be about, and I'm sorry, brother, I did not get your name, but it seems to be about, um, you know, is this actually the responsibility of artists to save orchestras? So it's the sort of, you know, labor management, artist, manager divide, and, and are we taking on, um, you know, issues that, that aren't ours to take on. I, I, so, just, I just need to quickly address um, Josh's question because I thought that was a good one. Like Josh, I'm an alumnus of a uh, of the Detroit Symphony Fellowship. So program. is Alex and I, both, yeah. all three of us yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I understand what you mean by psychological warfare. There's always gonna, gonna be the feeling that, oh, um, these people are here to save me or I'm here to save you. And, uh, and we're throwing you a bone. But I stress every day that you are not throwing anybody a bone, you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're doing, you, I, I had to jot it down, you are fighting against the racist culture that we've operated in silently since the founding of our nation. So we have to stop <laughs> viewing these sorts of programs as, as us being thrown a bone or, or, or given a leg up. No, you're doing what you, are supposed to be doing to, to, you know, to cure the the sickness that we've been living in for 200 years. Excellent, excellent. Um, does someone want to take up uh, Charles's question? You know, and how this new era? Right. Are we in a new yeah. era? But this, I, John, do you want to speak? Well, just a little bit. Just and and uh, goes along with you were saying, like with with Josh too. It. Um, I was the first recipient of the fellowship program after I had been subbing with the orchestra for two years. I had already proved myself. They started this and they said, we'd like, you should audition for this. And so I did, and Steve Millen was the other winner of it. And so overnight I went from being their colleague to the, so, some of them treating me like I was a student and um, didn't play as well as they did. And so what I had to do was be so prepared all of the time. And that's the same thing in, you know, with what's going on in, in the world right now. You know, when they asked Aaron this you know, similar question the other night, and when the students broke down and were upset about uh, you know, the, re the result of the election, he said the best thing you can do is go practice right now. Now is the time. You know, when Ronald Reagan was elected, my sister took me aside and said, you're, you're gonna stay in school because the world's gonna be different right now. You're gonna get your masters, you're gonna, you know, and, and it's, so it's just, a, it's a time for us to do the best that we can because when you do the best and you are the best, no one can take that away from you. You can call me all of the names you want. Just because you call me a pig doesn't make me a pig. But if I, if you know, I stand up on stage and I do, you know, and and I blow you away with how I play, you can't say anything. It's mm -hmm. it's it's you can't, you know, it's it's it, it's not going to affect me, mm -hmm. you know. It's and hopefully will affect you in a positive way. Maureen, was there anything in there that sparked an answer to any of these questions? I think we all know. I mean, we're all here because we love the arts, and what better outlet to basically contradict what is going on right now in our country and show that we can all be a part of the culture that we live in. And we can use music to do that. What better way to do that? Mm -hmm. All of us together, mm -hmm. instead of just rolling over and saying, you know what, yeah, fine, let's, let's just quit. Titus, what about this, this question of the responsibility of the oppressed to educate the oppressor? You sort of touched on something like that. Uh, like, like, I, like I said before, I, I just, I really think that, um, I really think that some people, if we're talking about oppressor or we're talking about dominant white supremacist society, if that's what we're talking about, those who are saying, who are in white society saying, I'm sick of seeing you. There's nothing to be ashamed of if you have relatives that are that say racist stuff. 
be ashamed of that. That's where you're from. Like, it's like people say, oh, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, no, I didn't come from that. If that's where you grew up, that's where you grew up. You know, that's where you come from. So if your family happens to be saying stuff that's wrong, then own that and then make that change. And then pass on to your children something that's different. Have them read black literature. We're Americans. We've been here the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've been here. It's just that our voices are heard now and that we're in the public. We're talking about it. And it's in the mainstream now. So make it your duty to educate yourself and then you'll probably know how to change some of those unconscious biases and how you operate. So that's how I would say that's mm -hmm. the best way to navigate. I think organizations can also help set the table for this, right? So organizations can um, make the choice to lean into things and sort of frame things up that this is our organizational issue. This is not just the responsibility of our black musicians or our Latino musicians okay. to educate all of us about what everything should be, because you know, as we've said the whole time, it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of weight to be the representative, right? So there's there's also an organizational responsibility that the leadership and anyone within the organization can encourage the organization to to take up. Okay, we have uh, some time for some more questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Danielle Taylor. I'm a violinist and violist from East Oakland, East Oakland, California. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, I, over the years, I've heard a lot of conversations about the challenges and ways that we participate in predominantly white institutions. And although there are so many honorable efforts to try to diversify the look of it, I'm wondering how much of it is about the optics of diversity, right? You have a black person and black body, but don't be too black when you're in there, right? So how much when we bring our stuff, because you know, people tell you, you have to dress in a very particular way and nod your head and bow and say yes and thank you and keep your decibel level below or people will look at you. So when we're talking about acceptance and inclusion, are we, are we just molding people to be very, um, like permissible black people or just, just be there just enough to be visible but don't make anybody else uncomfortable with who you are and how you are when you bring your history to the table, right? So I'm talking about, yeah, the, the, the optic shift but also the paradigm shift in the rehearsal room and in the boardroom or wherever we find ourselves. Can you remind me of your name one more time? Danielle. Danielle, that's yeah. what I call her. Thank you. Look, this is kind of the flip side of that question. Ted Whitford, New York Philharmonic. I want to know what some of the things are that those of us in these historically white institutions who come from background of privilege, what are some of the things we don't see? You know, what are some of the things that we're doing unwittingly that are making your lives difficult? It's a great question, Ted. Woo. Thank you very much. Woo. So, <laughs> just to review, and we're, uh, we're 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 running on we're running short on time. So, but just to review, but but these <laughs> panelists have. Oh, all right, let's get right. it. Come on. Danielle spoke, and I got to show up too. I'm from Oakland, also. My name is Angela Wellman, well, okay. and I'm the founding director of uh, the Oakland Public Conservatory of Music. Um, the co thank you. Go on, give that up. Um, the question I have for you is, 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 is an intersectional, intersectionality question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a trombonist. I wanted to become a orchestral trombo an, or an orchestral trombonist. Growing up in a jazz uh, family in Kansas City, Missouri, I was sort of steered that way. My teacher, who had a DMA from University of Indiana, would not teach me what he knew. Um, and so, when I look at the photos of the trombone sections in these orchestras, black orchestras, white orchestras, I don't see any girls or young women who look like mm. me now. Mm. I miss my boat. But, um, and so I'm, I'm working to strive to kind of change that. Mm -hmm. So um, a young black woman playing a violin or a flute or a harp, mm. doors are open in different ways than you know, young black women who play trombones like I was when I was a little girl. Mm. So I'm curious as to how people are sort of looking at that intersectional issue of multiple oppressions mm. and how we're opening doors for black girls. Mm. Mm. I wanna, mm. All right. I, I, wanna, I wanna quickly address uh, Danielle Taylor's question. Um, I think the optics are absolutely important. I think it's important to see dark skin on stage. But like I said earlier, I choose not to play it safe from any 
perspective. I think you need to bring all of your blackness to the table because that changes the thinking that has maintained orchestras as predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's, I'm sorry, can, uh, what, what, tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Angela, Angela Wellman from Kansas City, Missouri. All right, Angela. Um, does anyone want to take up uh, Angela's question? This, 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 this issue of um, our expectations, well maybe this is also where the screen comes in, this, our expectations about who should be playing which instruments. But th there was another question over here. Uh, just uh, about what Ted, we No, we're going to get to Ted's question. Okay, okay, okay. I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's a oh, you want me to answer a question? Yeah, just speak to... Um, uh, as far as like being being shut out, um, I, like I said before, I think that the system has to be different. Because sometimes, at times, to be honest, sometimes I feel like, am I the token within this? It, did I did I make it? Am I the one within the structure? Because we've seen that throughout history. There's been a black person here, black person there, black person, there, and people are like, but well, I don't see that many people. We talk about all these programs, but where is everybody? Like, are they in the positions? Or are we just in fellowships and we go about our way? A fellowship and go about our way. Are, are people actually getting into the professional field where they're earning a living, like living, doing what you do? So I do think as far as this is concerned, that's why I said we need to really approach and talk about the system that's in place. Because a lot of times when the audition process is going on, a lot of orchestras are not accountable for what they do. They say, okay, we're not, we're not hiring anybody, bye. Now I'm just saying it's very complicated, I get that. I understand that it's a lot of complicated, how someone sounds, what school they go to, whatever. I get that, but we need to really dive into how people are being picked for the job, and then if we can really dissect that, we'll start to break down a lot of these barriers, and we'll see more people who are representative of a person like you say, you know what, I couldn't get in there. Why? Because they saw you, that's why. So I do think, I think if they can take that out of their mind, I'll give one, one really quick thing. I remember one time I was in an audition, and I was about to walk in, and I was thinking they knocked on the door, and I was like, oh man, I need to have my Mozart right, my reed wet, blah, 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 and I walk on the stage, and it's like, ladies and gentlemen, Titus Hunter, when I hear a clap, and I walk on the stage, people say, oh. Yeah, I say, oh yeah, I me. am black. I forgot about that. <laughs> because I don't walk around and say, I'm black today, let me go live my black life. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that way. I get up and brush my teeth like everybody else. I think that's, so, a, great, I think that's a great transition to, to Ted's right. question. If we can, I know they're gonna be mad, but we're gonna push through, so go ahead and someone uh, take up, Ted's asking for practical, what do we do? What are we doing? How do we do it differently? Uh, I guess I'll jump in there. Like, like I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Like yeah. I'm saying, it, it depends on, what, 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 if you think that some, something's been affected, a lot of times, say, okay, and read, like I said, reading these authors, Reading these people who write about this stuff, there's so much material of anything. Like, people have been writing since the 1800s, black people writing about this stuff. And, we, I mean, we've been sitting back looking at white society for a long time. So it's like, how much do you know us? Because we know a lot about, I mean, because that's how, that's why we talk about navigating in the first place. It's like, how do you navigate living around? Because, because a lot of people haven't lived around black people, and they say, am I doing things that are wrong, and then when you start reading those books and you see that mirror, they say, oh, I see, oh, I understand now. And then you understand what am I doing that subconscious. Like, when I, like I say, we live in a, a very male-dominated society as well, so when I talk to women about things, I say, let me listen, let me hear what she has to say. Let me go read a female author and hear what she has to say. And then let me just listen, because I'm not gonna come in there and own this and be like, oh yeah, I'm, let me chime in. No, let me just listen, let that sit down, let that hurt a little bit. Let me own that, let me feel that and change. Gary, so I do something? think that's, that's, that'll push forward, yeah. And, and, and I'll go specifically talking about um, the orchestra setting, and this is really quick. So I didn't come through the conservatory pipeline. You know, I went to the University of Memphis and I went to the um, University of Southern California, all right? Um, so, I th so I've noticed that when we're talking about people subbing in orchestras, they're looking to certain teachers, they're looking to certain schools. So if you are in a position of, of power or authority with the symphony orchestra, I challenge you to take two or three hours out of your day to find um, a black musician in your community, in your city, and invite him or invite her to come be a sub. Do, do that thing, do that one thing. Mm -hmm. Support what these guys have been saying though too, uh, the, the movie Hidden Figures, 
comes out and Facebook blows up with all of these people saying, how come we didn't know about this? Mm -hmm. You know, we, so, you know, learn a little bit more. We all need to learn a, a bit more. Mm -hmm. It's, um, mm -hmm. may not be happening in the school system in the next couple of years, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's up to us to, to do our own room. homework. <laughs> um, Maureen, do you yeah. have any? No, you're good? All right. Uh, would you guys, first off, I'd like to thank Sphinx for offering us this opportunity and congratulate them on 20 wonderful years. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thanks a lot. Man. Thanks a lot.